So, like another question then is, what is even real? <laughs> <laughs> right. I because... mean, fundamentally, like, is this real? You know, is this as real as if we were having this conversation face to face? Mm. Not rhetorical. Like, what, what would you say? So weirdly, the first thought in my mind was uh, internet trolls. <laughs> Do we, are we are we popular enough to have trolls? <laughs> no, 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 no. I don't think we are. But but sort of the to really answer that question of of real. So one sort of problem that you have when you get into internet communication about anything that matters, right? right. Like. Nobody's going to troll. Well, most people won't troll you for taking pictures of your dinner. Right. Right. But the moment you start posting something that means something to you, right? Like your religion or your politics on Facebook. Um, there's a much higher chance that, that someone will be offended by that and, and troll you for it. Right. And so the, is that because, you know, posting things on Facebook is less real or is that because posting things on Facebook allows people to vent in a way that they can't in person? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and so is that, more, is, is that more or less real, right? The way I would answer that question, and I still want you to answer my question. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the way I'd answer that question about like our internet trolls real is, does it still hurt you, right? Mm. Because um, when someone has like trolled my Facebook status and put some crap on there, I find it affects me emotionally, right? That's real, you know, because they're, they're those keyboard warriors as they're called, right? <laughs> Hiding in their uh, parents' basement. Oh, yikes. What, what they did affected me, you know? Mm-hmm. So I would have to recognize the reality of that. But I still want to go back to me and you. Okay. Are we real right now? Yeah. I mean, I I'm real. I, okay. I'm not. Oh, and I'm touch and I'm touching my skin as I as I say that. Right. Is our interaction real? Okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, this feels a lot to me like when you and I are. Yeah. You know, sitting on my back porch or in between uh in between plenary sessions at the clergy <laughs> conference or <laughs> when we're taking too long to get back <laughs> um, right or you know when we're when we're cruising through bookstores or comic yeah. book shops <laughs> <laughs> all right so it feels real so it is yeah real. right it okay. feels real yeah. If that's the case, like if we're if we're going to allow that this is reality, that this is real, that this is not unreal or non-real or that this not even that this is hyper real, that this is just a different kind of real. Why would we not think that God can be just as present in the midst of this reality as a face to face one? So one of the reasons why I brought up the priesthood thing earlier is that I don't actually think the question is one of reality. For me, I think the question is one of authority. And, and I think the reason why um, and I think the reason why we are so uncomfortable with viewing this as real is that it's sort of a gray area in the, um, like for instance, if, um, if you and I were, if you and I and some other lay people were separated and I was, and we could 
sort of consecrate bread and wine at a distance. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what's to say that someone couldn't watch that video later and say that they partook of consecrated bread and wine? Right. Yeah. Right, because once you sort of separate space, like why can't you separate time? And I think well, that, that, but we already do separate time, right? Like, and that's what I'm saying is that it, this is not really a question of yeah. reality. Like, this is a question of. I think that all of this is too novel for the church to have really figured out how it fits into its conception of authority. All right, so I'm going to go out on a limb then since we keep talking about the Eucharist, but on the same thing, to say, isn't every Eucharist that we do in person already just a digital copy of one that's already been done? <laughs> right? Like, think about the Eucharistic prayer one and right one, you know. This is a, that it, it's a recapitulation of, of um, the sacrifice of Christ, you know, the oblation once offered, right? So any Eucharist that we talk about, you know, in Anglican tradition, because we're not talking about right. the perpetual sacrifice. We cannot, speak the for, we cannot speak for other traditions. Right. 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 But in Anglican and, Eucharistic theology, every Eucharist only derives its meaning from something that happened in 33 AD. Right, and what's more, like there's already a good deal of extra spatial and extra temporal theology in the Eucharist, right? So yeah. when we say the Sursum Corda, right, lift up your hearts, there are many theological writers which talk about that as a moment when we're all lifted from time and space and transported into whatever kind of time and space heaven exists in, right? Is there a heaven? Are we agreed on that? <laughs> no, not necessarily. <laughs> but in the um, theological system, yeah. But in that, well, and, and maybe in that co-eternal time, in that, yeah. in that eternal time and space sort of conception. Um, so even if, you know, you don't necessarily agree with an afterlife, there is a sort of lifting up in the Eucharist to this each this eternal space which exists outside of what we would normally consider time and space right absolutely and so why is that so different than what we're talking about in this digital age right 100 percent right? agree yeah and i think the answer to that doesn't actually have a whole lot to do with theology i think the answer to that is that the church has not figured out, a, like I said before, the church hasn't mm -hmm. figured out a way in its sort of, in the way that it thinks about how authority is derived. The church hasn't really figured out a way to fit that into its worldview yet. And I think that's the only thing that is sort I of holding it back. Because we, we already have a fairly strong part of our tradition that, there's already a sense that the Eucharist that I participate in in, in Alamogordo is the same Eucharist that Christopher participates in in Los Alamos, even though we celebrate services at different times and, you know, five hours apart. Right. Right? There's the sense that we're all entering the same liminal space when we celebrate the Eucharist. Yeah, because we're we're entering collectively the liminal space of Good Friday. Right. Right. Exactly. I think that. Yeah, I'm, I mean, it's encoded in our prayers. You know, to lift up your hearts. How about when we sing the song to us? You know, we join with the saints and angels in the song that rings throughout eternity. Right. It's in Isaiah and it's in Revelation, right? And there are echoes of it throughout our entire biblical record. And the whole idea of that is that 
we enter, you know, the witness of the past and the witness of the future in the same moment. It's 